Good afternoon and welcome to At Yale Live. I'm Eric Gershon. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Lynch, Director of the Yale Cancer Center and Physician-in-Chief at Smilo Cancer Hospital at Yale New Haven. Today we'll talk with him about some of the latest developments in cancer research and care. And of course, as always, we'll ask him some of your questions. Glad to have you with us. Eric, great to be here. Let's start with a big picture question. Um, what is it about cancer as a general category of disease that makes it so powerful and so hard to cure? What makes cancer different is that cancer is a disease of genes. The same genes that make our normal cells work well, those same genes get become abnormal, get taken over, and become cancerous, and the cells grow uncontrollably. And what makes it such a difficult disease to control is that to interrupt those genes, it's the same gene processes that we need in regular cells. Whereas when you have an infection with a bacteria or a virus, it's a different set of proteins you can go after. So you have different targets that aren't innately human and they're not innately part of us, the way a cancer cell is really very similar to a liver cell or a lung cell. And our basic, our basic, uh, is basic cancer research basically keeping up with treatment? Or that is, are they tracking each other? As we learn a lot more about uh, how cancer works, um, are we also coming up with newer treatments almost as, as fast? Well, I, I would say we're probably a little behind on the newer treatments. We've, we've jumped ahead dramatically in the understanding of cancer over the past five years. So we've known for quite some time that cancer is a disease caused by abnormal genes. The genes, the gene genetic changes drive cancer. And that was known probably 25 years ago. However, what's been learned over the past five years is what the extent and nature of those genetic changes are like. And that's because the ability to sequence DNA and look at genetic changes has advanced dramatically rapidly. For example, at Yale's West Campus, we have one of the world's largest genomic facilities under the direction of Rick Lifton, where we can sequence an entire human genome in about six days, five to six days, and get that information. That used to take two, three years. In fact, the first human genome took 12 years to be done. So you can see that this ability to look within each cancer cell's genes and rapidly detect what's normal and what's abnormal has led to this incredible understanding of what drives cancer. However, what we don't know is how to change that. And that's why therapy is a little bit behind our understanding. And I think that's gonna exist for the next several years. Lately, we, we hear a lot about personalized medicine. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that means, and especially in its relation to treating cancer? So, Eric, that's a great example. So what I mean by what we talk about personalized medicine is we can look at Mrs. Johnson's lung cancer, and we can look inside her lung cancer cells and find out which cells, what genes are abnormal, and direct a specific therapy to her genes. Or we can look at Mr. Ramirez's lung cancer and figure out it might be a different set of genes that are abnormal in his situation. And so we would give different drugs in that setting. When I started off as an oncologist uh, 20 years ago, we would give the same drugs to everybody. And now we're tailoring it to each individual patient. Are there uh, particular advances, say, in the last few years or the last couple of years even, uh, that you're especially excited about and they're showing you know, promise that you wouldn't have anticipated? Well, well, Eric, there's advances in the last several weeks that we're excited about, not just the last several years. So just last week, we learned in a type of lung cancer called squamous cell lung cancer, we learned about new genes that are abnormal in that cancer. And we're matching those to drugs that we think might be important. And some of the labs at Yale are specifically looking at these particular genes that were found to be abnormal in squamous cell and saying, how can we turn those genes off? So I think this, this research is developing incredibly fast. Another big area we're, we're excited about are immune therapies for cancer. So for years, we've tried to use the body's immune system to become more effective in, in cleaning and searching for cancer cells. This year, for the first time, we've shown that in lung cancer, melanoma, and kidney cancer, we're able to use monoclonal antibodies to turn on the immune system, something we couldn't imagine three years ago, let alone 10 years ago. I was going to ask you about the uh, squamous lung cancer paper. Um, did you know that was coming? And we, we knew part of it was coming. A lot of it was reported at some of the big cancer meetings mm -hmm. we all go to. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, on the web, we hear, this, we hear these results somewhat early. But that paper was the first publication of the data. Until the publication comes out, you never really know exactly what you're dealing with. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions that uh, have come into us from uh, the general public. Uh, this one has come uh, from uh, Twitter on social media. It's from at Kara, and uh, she says she asks, 
I've been hearing a lot about epigenetics as a new frontier in cancer research. Can you explain and do you agree that it's got some real potential? Well, Kara clearly knows what she's talking about and <laughs> clearly is on top of what's happening in cancer <laughs> research. So I explained that genes are at the heart, genetic changes are at the heart of what makes something cancerous. Well, epigenetics is really at the heart of the genetic changes is what we're finding. So what epigenetics refers to, it's, it's the changes in the structure of genes that influences how genes make proteins. So epigenetic changes have to do with how genes are regulated within cells, okay? So it's sort of a way of thinking about it as these are the elements within a cell that can turn a gene on or turn a gene off. So you might have a mutation, but what might be more important is the way the epigenetics inside that, epigenetic changes within that cell can turn that gene on or turn that gene off. And that can be the difference between whether the gene is silent or whether the gene is active. So epigenetic changes we're appreciating are incredibly important in cancer. And what's interesting is we have a number of exciting drug targets that are now being developed to go after epigenetic changes. I think that's one of the most exciting things in cancer over the next three to four years. So it's really primarily a research uh, area at this point. Well, research area now, but there are yeah. some drugs on the market that are actually effective in cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, for example, that target the epigenome, as we call it. So it's, it's, it's not just research, it's actually helping patients. Good, good. I'm gonna take another question, uh, also uh, submitted to us by Twitter. This one is from at PremedGirl in New York City. And she asks, what's the number one thing you recommend uh, to women with a genetic history uh, of breast cancer in order to, to prevent it? So I think, Eric, that's a great question from Pre-Med Girl. I, I'd say one of the things I find most interesting there is that we talked about how cancer is caused by genetic changes within the cancer. Well, we also know that each of us brings a certain genetic environment to our cells that we get from our mother and our father. Mm -hmm. And so somebody who's got a history of breast cancer in their family may be predisposed to getting breast cancer themselves. Now again, 20 years ago, we didn't really know what genes were important in, in breast cancer risk. Today, we have much more information about that. And so women who have a history of breast cancer in their family, I would strongly recommend should talk to a, a, a certified genetic counselor, a licensed genetic counselor, to talk about whether testing for those genes for them makes sense. Because you can find out whether or not your family risk is, is actually realized by having specific genes that are abnormal. So that's a very important tool that's available to women now that wasn't available 10 years ago. Well, let's say you get that testing and you learn that, yes, you're very much at risk. What can, you, what can you do with that information to protect well, that, yourself? That's a great question. There's lots of different options that women can look at. Some women can choose to, um, uh, might choose to determine when to have their children. Maybe they have their mm -hmm. children a little bit earlier so that if they decide to have prophylactic surgery, mm -hmm. such as mastectomies, mm -hmm. they might have their children in their late 20s and then choose to have prophylactic mastectomies. Other women can choose to take certain medications that can reduce the incidence of developing breast cancer. Other women might choose just to have very close monitoring and do MRIs very carefully to look for small changes and try to pick the cancers up early. It becomes a woman's individual choice, again, only after seeing a licensed genetic counselor and talking to a breast surgeon and breast cancer expert who can help advise on these different choices. And it is tailored, it's another example of personalized medicine, it is tailored to which gene is abnormal and what is the woman's choice, Where, how old is she, what is she? Uh, what are her preferences, and what does she want to do? Uh, but there are the good news is there are ways of reducing that risk. Are we in a better position to use uh, those kinds of tests for, uh, with respect to breast cancer, than for other kinds of cancers? We're much better with breast cancer than other ca types of cancer. We're getting better at colorectal cancer. So colon cancer is a good example where we now know about. Um, about certain genes that are seen more often in colon cancer. I would say that colon and breast are probably the two most important uh, 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 gene, uh, uh, predisposing gene syndromes that we know about and where genetic counseling has made the most difference in cancer. But every year we're learning about new areas and new genes that predispose to developing cancers. And there are a number of rare genetic syndromes, but in terms of common cancers, I'd say it's colon cancer and breast cancer. Let me ask you a little bit about your own specialty. You're an expert in lung cancer. How did you, what, what is it that drew you to lung cancer in particular? 
as a specialist. So it's the Willie Sutton law, okay? Meaning it's where it's, it's the leading cause of cancer death in the world. Um, you know, it, it's what's getting getting people uh, on, on on a broad spectrum globally in terms of death from cancer. So I was tr attracted mm -hmm. to the fact that nobody was studying lung cancer. It was an underappreciated disease. There was a, a strong feeling when I started in lung cancer in the 90s that well. The patient smoked, it's their fault. Why should we do research in this area? Well, we know several things. One, it's not the patient's fault if they smoked. They lived in a society where tobacco was promoted incredibly heavily. Second, there are plenty of people who never smoked who got lung cancer and still need to have research done to help their cancer. There's more never smokers who die of lung cancer than there are never smokers who die of testis cancer, um, Hodgkin's disease, thyroid cancer combined. So it's, it's, a, it's a common a relatively common phenomena, and that's one of the things that drew me to it. And, 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 and the fact that there was so little work being done in lung cancer, I, find, I found that to be quite disturbing, and I was drawn to that. Um, and how is it going with respect to lung, lung cancer as opposed to others? So lung cancer during the course yeah. of my career, I think a couple things have happened. First, we know for people with a smoking history who are over 55, they should strongly consider getting CAT scan screening, CT scan screening, and we can pick up nodules early and we can save lives. So that's something we didn't know about 20 years ago. Only learned about that two years ago. Second, we've learned about a number of genes in lung cancer and a number of new drugs that specifically work well in those patients who carry those genetic abnormalities. And the, that would be the EGFR gene, the ALK gene, and the ROS gene. Again, exciting things that we're, that we're really looking forward to. This is sort of more of a public health question than a, a medical question, but um, uh, have anti-smoking campaigns, uh, publicity campaigns, seem to have affected, uh, you know, the incidence of lung cancer at all? They have. They've been, they, it's been terrific. So what we've seen is we've seen that the age-adjusted mortality for lung cancer among men has fallen, which is terrific, because men actually stopped smoking a little bit earlier than women have. We're now starting to see among women a flattening of the curve, suggesting that women are stopping smoking. And, and the, actually, the number of teen smokers in the United States is finally beginning to decline. So our anti-smoking efforts have been very successful. Doesn't mean we don't need to continue them. We do need to continue them. We still have a very high smoking rate. It's approximately 24, 25 percent in the United States. But efforts to reduce smoking have definitely helped reduce the incidence of lung cancer. However, you go to some countries, like Indonesia. In Indonesia, 70 percent of men smoke cigarettes. So there are parts of the world where tobacco is still commonly used uh, compared to the United States. In Europe, the smoking rates are dramatically higher than they are in the U.S. in many countries. Let's take another uh, question from a um, member of the public. This one comes from Gabriel Ellsworth. He emailed it to us. Uh, he describes himself as a Yale alumnus working in Kenya at Tenwek Hospital. And let me quote <clears throat> from his message to us. Quote, our long-term goal is to develop a multidisciplinary approach in rural Kenya. We would need a full-time oncologist and a dedicated cancer center, which might be a long way off. We are thinking big, but if you have any advice on incremental steps to, to make treatment more multidisciplinary in the developing world, let us know your thoughts. Great question. The National Cancer Institute of the United States has made it a priority to encourage cancer centers in the United States to begin to partner with developing nations who are trying to improve their cancer outcomes. So there are many universities around the world that have efforts to try to improve this. There are, there are countries in sub-Saharan Africa where there may be one radiation machine in the entire country. Um, and so the idea of bringing multidisciplinary care is of high priority to parts of, of Africa. And I think Africa is a great example where there are people dying of curable cancers that aren't getting treated and not getting recognized in a timely fashion. When you look at some of the terrific inroads that have been made in HIV in Africa, obviously not cured yet, problem not solved yet, but huge improvements in several of the countries where effort has been put into this and multidisciplinary focus and attention has been brought to bear. In your experience as a clinician, have you perceived any major misconceptions uh, by and among uh, cancer patients and families about cancer diseases and about their treatment? I think in terms of misconceptions, I think the, the thing that you probably hear most commonly is, you know, is cancer contagious, okay? Can you get cancer from somebody else? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is, is definitely no, it's not contagious. Viruses that may predispose you to cancer are contagious. Viruses like hepatitis, human papillomavirus, HIV, those are contagious. Um, but 
actual cancer itself is not contagious. So you don't get cancer by hugging your grandma or, 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 or hugging a patient who's got cancer. But you can effectively get it from your forebears, right? Well, because you can, get, the genetic you can get a predisposition to cancer from, okay. your, from your mom and dad. Yeah. Okay, so your mom and dad can give you a predisposition to getting cancer. You know, it's something we've known for years. Diseases run in families. Yeah. Families that have heart disease tend to have a lot of heart disease. Yeah. Families with a lot of diabetes tend to have a lot of diabetes. Families with a lot of cancer tend to have a lot of cancer, and it's because of what's in our genes. Um, are, there, are there any major non-scientific challenges that you see that facing cancer research today, political or social obstacles? So I think the biggest thing I would say from a political standpoint is the funding mm -hmm. for cancer research. Mm -hmm. So right now, the uh, NIH, the total budget of the NIH is 30.1. National Institutes of Health. National Institutes yeah. of Health. <clears throat> total budget of National Institutes of Health is $30.1 billion. That has been declining for the past three years. And one of the frustrating mm -hmm. things is if you're a Democrat or if you're a Republican, um, in the past, there was bipartisan support for increasing funding of cancer research and medical research. And what we've seen since 2003, which is now almost nine years of relative flat funding during that time, at exactly the time when we have all these tools and genetics to look into diseases and to help patients. And I think one of the frustrating things of the, of the gridlock in Washington, and again, Democrats and Republicans are, are equal opportunity blame in this situation. We need to refocus attention on cancer research and health research in general. It's one of the things that makes this country great. It's one of the things that we have a huge advantage globally over other countries on. And if we don't continue to invest in research and invest in science, we will miss an extraordinary opportunity. So what can executives such as yourself at, at cancer facilities do to sort of lobby for well, that? Well, we do that. We have all of our professional societies are actively advocating. Uh, Dr. Roy Herbst, who's the chief of oncology at Yale, Roy was on Capitol Hill yesterday talking to senators and representatives to advocate for more cancer funding. Uh, he's Yale class of 84 and a, and a, and a, a huge supporter of cancer research. Uh, but also the public needs to tell the representatives that they care about cancer funding. Mm. In your view, um, what serious cancer problems really deserve, deserve more attention than they're getting? That is, um, are, there, are, there, are there problems that are sort of being overlooked for one reason or another? So I think, I think that's a great question about, about which cancers can we do a better job on. I think that there are, there are uh, there's a question of access to care. So one of the things we know in the United States is that if you look at people from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds, we know that access to care is not as good. We know that colonoscopy screening rates, for example, are lower in lower socioeconomic uh, groups of patients. We want to improve that. We want to make sure that mammograms are obtained. We want to make sure that, that, that good preventative cancer screenings happen uh, better in this country. We can do a better job of doing that. In a state like Connecticut, we actually have a very high rate of colonoscopy screening in our state. And as a result, we have a lower rate of death from colorectal cancer. I'd love to see that happen throughout the country. What do you attribute that to? Actually, a great question. Is, is, it, is it part of it cultural, part of it that it's something that everyone does, and if you know that your neighbor is going to get a colonoscopy, maybe you're more likely to get the colonoscopy too? Interesting. You must be asked this all the time because it's sort of the, qu the question that I think most people who have had cancer or have cancer or know someone who has, which is a huge percentage of the population, ask, is, do you believe that cancer can be cured in the way that uh, you know, we've eradicated other diseases? So, Eric, one of the real goals of the Yale Cancer Center is to increase the cure rate of cancer, without a doubt. That's why we wake up in the morning. That's why we come to work, is we're working to improve the cure rate of cancer. I believe that we will, over the next 10 years, begin to see improvements in the cure rate. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be cured. It doesn't mean that we're going to cure everyone with cancer, but we're going to begin to take that number. Right now, it's 50% of all patients with cancer are cured. We want to keep taking that, and it's not including skin cancers. Mm -hmm. We want to take that number and, and increase it by a couple of percentage points, and I think that we're going to see that number begin to go up. So yes, I do believe we can increase the cure rate of cancer. Maybe I should have asked this first. When we talk about a cure for cancer, how, are we do, how do we define cure? As I always like to tell patients, I define a cure is that you'll end up dying of old age while you're flying to a beach in Florida uh, to celebrate uh, your 95th mm -hmm. birthday, okay? Uh, so that's what I define as cure. Okay. I think somebody who lives a life without symptoms of cancer 
or any evidence of cancer causing them any difficulties. That, to me, is an example of cure. Now, what do epidemiologists call cure? They call five-year survival. If you go five years without the cancer coming back, for most cancers, that's equal to cure. Not for every cancer, but for most cancers. Smilo Cancer Hospital uh, at Yale New Haven opened three years ago now? We Is opened three years, yep. fully, fully occupied two years ago. What's it been like to start a cancer hospital from scratch? It's been a terrific opportunity. Smilo Cancer Hospital has over 170 beds dedicated for cancer patients, plus 12 teams of multidisciplinary specialists. It's been terrific to be able to bring this to the Southern Connecticut area and really to the nation. Our patients come from all over the country now to come to Smilo Cancer Hospital. And our goal now, now that the hospital's open and established, is really to focus on taking some of the incredible science that's happening at Yale and translate that into new therapies for patients. And we're working really hard across the university to bring the science of Yale, which has always been terrific, to impact on the care of patients with cancer. So it's really a challenge that I think all of us are incredibly engaged in right now. One more question uh, from the public. This from a Peter Lamoth in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, it's kind of on a lighter note. Um, he, wants, he, he says that he knows that you are a huge New England Patriots fan and wants to know what are the odds that Tom Brady leads the team to a fourth Super Bowl win this year. So I'm, uh, Peter knows this. I'm feeling yeah. very optimistic about Tom Brady uh, doing very well this year. He had a fantastic opening game against the Titans. I expect good things this weekend against the Cardinals, and I'd say the odds are about 75% that he brings home the fourth title this year. Thanks so much for joining us. This has been really Great, fun. Great, Eric. It's been enjoyable. And thanks uh, to all of you for watching At Yale Live. Please tune in again next month. Thanks so much. Thank you.